Okay, now, uh, hi everyone, welcome to our alumni sharing session today. Um, today's session will be a one hour session, and today we are going to discuss more about the uh, role of pharmacists during COVID 19 pandemic. So, uh, mm -hmm. if you think this is going to be beneficial and informative to your friends and family, please do help us share and like this. And of course, in between the session, if you have any questions, just feel free to drop them in the comments and we will come to you during the Q&A session. All right. Okay, so uh, without further delay, now it's two, one. Mm, maybe we can start the session with some very brief introduction. Who are we in the session? And I would like to share with all of you is that uh, I'm introduce myself first. I'm Ling Wei, the secretary of IMU Alumni Association. I graduated from IMU Bachelor of Pharmacy Honors uh, Cohort B107 and currently working as lecturer under IMU School of Pharmacy, Department of Life Sciences. I will be the host of this day with the other two alumni pharmacists, Kemping and Morgan, who are here to share with us their working experience during this COVID-19 pandemic period. And for your information, Camping and Morgan are both also graduated from IMU Bachelor of Pharmacy Honours and three of us are actually batchmates. So um, as for Camping, he is currently working as Chief Business Optimization Officer in MPM Pharmacy a medium-sized chain pharmacy with 35 outlets that are concentrated in Johor, Penang, and Sabah. His role in MPM Pharmacy involves uh, business strategies development in primary and healthcare services. And uh, during the COVID-19 period, he is actively involved in ensuring continuous medical supply for both private and government healthcare institutions. And on top of that, he is also a newspaper columnist and a radio commentator for numerous medical related issues. So uh, thank you, Kempin, for accepting our invitation to share the, uh, his experience with us today. Thank you, everyone. So as for Morgan, Morgan, he is uh, now currently working with Ministry of Health Malaysia since August 2011. He has worked in UNMC Pharmacy Enforcement Division for eight years and currently attached to Putrajaya Hospital in the outpatient pharmacy. So uh, during this period, he has been working and in charge of the value-added services provided by the hospital, which he is going to share with us later on. So, all right. Uh, now, before we discuss further, just a very quick recap about the COVID-19 timeline in Malaysia. So, uh, as we know, the first case detected in Malaysia is actually on 24th January 2020. And in view of the increasing cases, our government announced an implemented movement control order, which we always call it MCO, starting uh, at March 2020 followed by conditional movement con uh, control order CMCO since 4th of May 2020 until now. So under the MCO and CMCO, pharmacy is listed as one of the essential services they allow to operate. So therefore, the first question I want to ask both of you is that um, throughout these months, how do you find yourself working in these periods as a pharmacist working? community and also from hospital setting is it more like more challenging or more stressful or you find no differences <laughs> has a go first yeah so I, I, I will discuss this from a community pharmacist point of view i, I think for the past three months it is the most uh, chaotic uh, period of time uh, in terms of private healthcare or even in a government healthcare system uh, worldwide it's not only in malaysia worldwide is facing the most challenging period 
I think after World War II, this is the most challenging period that we are facing at the moment. So um, from the community pharmacist point of view, as we know that uh, public prevention is actually the main, the most crucial way to flatten the curve. So when we talk about uh, public prevention, then who are there to actually have the most contact, who, who are the uh, healthcare uh, professional that have the most contact with the public is actually community pharmacists. If you look, every day we have uh, thousands and thousands of uh, customers come to us uh, asking us about questions about health related issues, uh, about preventions of uh, COVID-19. And we are there and we are the only few place, places uh, right, in Malaysia that allowed to open uh, throughout this MCO period to provide the right information to them. So to me, uh, the challenges is not only on the risk of exposing to, to the virus. You see, we see every day, we, we, as we know that COVID-19 can spread even through asymptomatic um, transmission. Yes. So yeah. we, we see patients that come to us as having cough and sore throat like that. It's actually, we, we can't know whether they are actually a normal virus uh, infected uh, patient or they are actually a uh, 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 COVID-19 carrier. So that is one of the challenges that we have to deal with. And we have to actually expose ourselves in terms of um, uh, 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 COVID during this COVID-19 pandemic. So I think the most uh, challenges part will be how to protect ourselves, how to protect our staff, our pharmacists who are working in the front line. And we, we never actually faced such uh, challenges before, right, uh, in, in our history. So in such short period of time, we actually have to learn how to, to wear PPE, how to source PPE, where, where to get uh, a quality mask, where to get protective, uh, a protective shield, where to produce and supply a large amount of hand sanitizer. And all these are uh, one of the challenges that we face, you see. So I think later on, we have uh, uh, another session that we talk about the more on the challenges. But if you ask me, being a community pharmacist in a private sector, this period is challenging, but it's actually giving us uh, the chance to prove to the public that uh, we actually play a very important role and, and in, the, in supporting the healthcare system. So Morgan, what about from pharmacy, uh, pharmacy in a hospital? Anything okay, uh, different or, yeah? Okay, uh, let's talk about the uh, uh, public sector as a whole, uh, you know, not just um, the uh, hospital setting. But yes. um, yeah, hospital setting wise, um, initially when MCO started, uh, all of us were wondering how are we going to go about this and whatnot. And um, working in Putrajaya Hospital, our outpatient is quite small, you know, it's quite cramped up and everything. So uh, for us to even uh, maintain the one meter, what do you call that? uh distance between each other was almost impossible so um the first initiative that we took was um to rotate the team you know we work on a every other day basis so one team works on monday for example the other team on tuesday and then wednesday back to the monday team and we were doing that initially and um what is that uh, we managed to run the show but um as what camping said uh, it has been a very, uh, what do you call that, uh, challenging period of time, mainly because um, patients still need a medication. That never stops, you know. So uh, we are working around the clock. Uh, we are still having our 24 hours shift. Uh, our emergency department is always open. So um, nothing pretty much changed, but our workload definitely increased uh, during the MCO period. And uh, that's mainly from the outpatient setting. But again, inpatient-wise and everything also, patients are still warded, babies are still being born. You know, nothing actually stops during the MCO period, you know. So I think um, uh, I think um, all pharmacies, you know, in the hospital sector uh, deserves a round of applause, like, you know, for all the work that they've been doing during this period. And um, yeah, on top of that, even the, what do you call that, uh, the, like, you know, the pharmacy, uh, pharmaceutical services division, um, those uh, people in those uh, area as well have been working hard, uh, mainly on the procurement of drug and everything, because um, nothing stops. You know, we have to make sure that we have enough of uh, medication stock for our patients. Um, in Putrajaya Hospital, we used we used to give patients uh, one month of medicine. Now we are providing them two months of medicine so that we can avoid the um, repeat. Uh, you know, we don't have them. We don't need them to come uh, again and again to the pharmacy. 
and uh, reducing their thus reducing their exposure to the virus as well. So yeah, mm -hmm. that's pretty much it during the public sector. Yeah, I do agree that a lot of, lot of things and a lot of practice already been changed because the social distancing. And of course, during MCO and even now CMCO, customers and patients, they are supposed not to come in and out freely as previous. So uh, I wonder if, let's say, those uh, routine patients like just come in or come out for like glucose or BP checking in community pharmacy, I believe there is a huge impact for them to come in and out in community setting. So uh, the next thing we are wondering is that, can you tell us the, despite all these challenges that we foresee, is there any other challenges on running the pharmacy from your side? And what are the measures that you have been taken to counteract all these cha challenges? Okay. I mean, from community pharmacy point of view, I think uh, during this period, there's a term that we always use is the new norm, right? The new norm, the new norm that we deal with patient, the new norm that we meet our supplier, the new norm that we actually start uh, conduct meeting. So never in my life that actually I I having tele conference so frequent. Every day I need to meet my uh, supplier uh, in, through tele conference. Never in my life that I am using it that frequent. But in this period, it becomes bread and butter to us. I think that that is one of the challenges that and um, we, we have to keep changing to cope with it right and like it or not talking to a laptop like that you know it, it's not something that i used to it but it, it has become uh, a norm that uh, everyone is practicing it i believe after cmco uh, this will be the new norm that we are talking and it, it might be uh not really the new norm, it might be the normal trends that uh, uh, in the future. So these are one of the uh, main changes in my working environment. And of course, if you're talking about patient, um, I wonder if there are uh, reduced patient crowd to uh, hospital pharmacy. I'm not too sure about that. But in terms of community pharmacy, people still come, uh, people still want to get their essential uh, uh, item. Uh, as I say, life still go on. People will still have higher lives. People will still have hypertension. People will still have high, uh, diabetic. You know, people that have gastric, it might worsen during CMCO because they eat a lot at home. And uh, <laughs> like that, uh, people still need help uh, that, uh, from, from us. And uh, we, we are still there to actually support them. But the, the, um, the way that uh, for all the, the way that they actually come into the pharmacy might change and as for your information uh, during cmco and mco we actually have movement control in pharmacy as well and uh, according to the rules and regulations set up by the local council and government there are limited uh, customers that can allow them to come in uh, at one time depending on the size and also the location and usually we set at five people so everyone that come in they have to uh, sanitize their hand they will get them a uh, uh, temperature measure. And in my working uh, 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 environment, we actually uh, make it compulsory for all the uh, customers to wear a mask before they come into the premises. Of course, some people say that, oh, I don't have a mask. Then we do take in, into consideration and we set a counter actually outside the pharmacy to actually serve uh, uh, those customers that are not able to buy or purchase a mask. We can't make it a compulsory in a, in a place like so that, that are the challenges that we face. But in terms of um, monitoring or management of disease, I think that is actually another issue that we have to look into it. So in terms of, um, I have got a lot of updates from my GP friends that uh, p their patient drop, uh, load actually dropped significantly. So we know that during COVID pandemic, everything is still go on. But, um, in terms of monitoring of chronic diseases, I think that it is actually being impacted significantly. Uh, our a lot of uh, uh, healthcare, primary healthcare facility actually stop temporarily uh, for blood taking for uh, what you call that uh, chronic disease monitoring. And a lot of private lab actually at the moment they do not take in uh, normal you know uh, blood tests for analysis. Because they are actually burdened by uh, uh, COVID nineteen PCR testing, so all these are challenges that we are facing. 
So in terms of measures, we, we can have to, to change from time to time. Like, as I say from just now, uh, you know, my working environment, from meeting the client or patient physically, we have to change to meeting them uh, online. And in terms of e-consultation, uh, last time, our uh, social media group, we always get about 50 to 100 inquiries per day. But during this period, it can be a few thousand uh, messages flow in to our social media every day to ask about uh, stock availability, to ask about oh, if they have yeah, this condition, should they go to see doctor right now or should they just wait our self-medication? So these are the challenges that uh, new norm that we actually facing. So if we actually do not prepare ourselves and get ready to change, it's actually quite challenging for us as well. Uh, just imagine 1,000 inquiries per day. Uh, we, we need to have a lot of people to answer the question at the back end. So that actually forced uh, our team to actually upgrade our system and capability as well to cope with the, the changes. For example, we actually built in chatbot to talk to the patient and gather the information and pharmacists just need to sit there for clinical question to answer the clinical question and for those that are asking about stock availability warehouse people will take over so such um, changes I, I i don't think that is something that i anticipate so far so fast to happen in my working uh, environment until you know we have this pandemic so i think that is uh, something that we face uh, I think last one that I would like to share is uh, the, the challenges that we face is medication, uh, medical supply. So as we know that uh, during March, uh, there is a very a huge shortage in terms of masks, right? We talk about masks, we are talking about trade by masks. So why, why this thing happened is that Malaysia, we actually, we are a country that depends 95% of uh, 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 mass supply from China. So in this case, when there is a shortage of masks in China itself, we can't get enough supply. And Malaysia, we have a few major uh, uh, main uh, manufacturers. Some of them actually focusing on overseas market all the while. So suddenly, when, when they have this outbreak, their orders are actually coming from all over the world to them as they are their existing clients. So until government actually banned the export of masks from Malaysia, we are actually facing a very difficult time um, during that period uh, to get a sufficient uh, face mask to uh, uh, even the healthcare professional. So at that time, I actually go on newspaper and talk about we should actually reserve the three prime masks to healthcare professional at that time. And, and as a public, if you stay at home, we, we do not need to actually store that much of masks uh, in our house. But now the situation changed. Now we have a, a, a CMCO where public is going to, to can, can allow to go outside. And I actually encourage public if you go out from your house to a crowded place, please always wear a mask. Be it a three point mask, be it a fabric mask, be it a cloth mask. As long as you wear a mask, it's actually uh, uh, prevent uh, uh, the, the transmission of the disease to other people. Right? So I think that is something that I would like to, to share regarding the challenges that we face. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Gambin. So, Morgan, from your side, how far do you see from there? Okay, uh, um, before I go on, uh, before I go into the challenges that we face, um, I actually forgot to mention about the other work that we do um, as a pharmacist, you know, uh, from my, what is that experience, um, I learned that um, even the pharmacists have been involved um, in taking the swap samples in the red zone areas and everything in KL. And this was uh, mainly participated by um, those uh, pharmacists who are working in the um, state office level, you know, state department level. Um, for example, the pharmaceutical enforcement division of KL, um, the uh, what do you call that, Amalan uh, Perkembangan, the practice and development side, um, and also the management side. You know, all those pharmacies, um, many of them have been on the ground uh, during, especially um, I realized uh, all my Malay colleagues, it was uh, during the Puasa month, and yet, mm -hmm. you know, they didn't have much time to spend with their family. They were down there in all the red zone areas, even those uh, other places which have um, high, what do you call that, uh, cases, you know, PUIs and whatnot. They've been taking samples, you know, uh, together with the doctors and everything. 
So um, I was quite surprised, you know. I thought pharmacists we are, will be more involved in just the medicine part, but who knew, you know, um, we could actually um, be trained and also be helpful in taking samples as well. So and on top of that, like what Kemping said on his side of uh, procurement and everything, um, our store as well has to be actively uh, procuring PPEs not only for the pharmacy but it's actually for the entire hospital. All the PPEs the doctors are wearing and everything has to be uh, procured and um, all the quantities um, is very important for it to be sufficient for everyone. Um, even hand sanitizers, you know, um, alcohol, because it has high content of alcohol and everything. So it's like a pharmaceutical product. We have to um, take charge of that as well. So mm -hmm. um, I think uh, the fact that all hospitals have been running quite smoothly means that the pharmacy department of every hospital has been doing a great job thus far. So going into the challenges um, of uh, the uh, COVID itself, um, as I mentioned to you, you know, the outpatient pharmacy, we always had the problem with um, social distancing. If we are working full force, there was no way that we we're going to have social distancing. So for the first one week or so, we were still working together and then it hit, you know, like uh, we can't be doing this. If uh, one of us becomes a PUI, you know, and one of us goes under quarantine, the entire team collapses. If and one entire team collapses, that's it. You know, we can't run a service at all in the hospital. So um, then the higher management came up with um, the options of uh, working every other day. And after a few weeks of doing that, then they decided, you know, let's go with every other week. It might be a better choice. And yes, uh, we went to doing that. So well, of course, the workload would have uh, increased with it as well. And the pa uh, for patients as well, you know, just like all the restaurants and like even pharmacy, I'm sure they have their one meter distancing tape and everything. So we did that every uh, we did that um, in the whole uh, of the hospital as well. Um, and even you know having lunch, you know, it was a staggered lunch so that you know. We don't sit in the pantry together and we still are serving patients as we go. A lot of uh, modifications were done. And then uh, the next challenge was the crowd control itself because um, Putrajaya Hospital, we cater to quite a big uh, community as well. And I'm not talking about Putrajaya itself. We are getting patients even from Rawang and whatnot. So um, what the clinics did is uh, first thing first, they postponed uh, appointments of patients who are uh, chronic, but they are stable, you know, that means they've been doing well with their current medications and everything. They postponed the appointment by at least two to three months, hoping that, you know, um, the curve flattens and then, you know, we can, they can see the patients. But even with the postponement of the appointments, the pharmacy has to work full force because the patients still need the medications. So they're not coming to the hospital to see the doctors, but they're coming to the hospital to see the pharmacies to get their medicine. Then um the another uh, step that um, the hospital proactively uh, um, took part in was uh, establishing uh, screening at the main lobby itself so all staff and all um, what you call that public who comes through the main lobby you have to go through uh, temperature screening uh, initially it was done uh, manually by the uh, what you call that the nurses and then later on we even set up like the temperature monitoring uh, system like um, it um, I think it uses infrared and it can uh, detect your temperature and they did that first and pharmacy also um, took part in the, at the what you call that uh, main lobby screening where mm -hmm. we started screening for those uh, what we call partial supplies of medication we send them to our drive through service instead instead of letting them come into the hospital so I can say that uh, Putrajaya Hospital has been very active in uh, active and proactive in uh, handling COVID-19 and to ensure that patients don't have um, much contact with the uh, within them, uh, with themselves, with others, and also with the health uh, healthcare workers. And of course, I think the biggest challenge would be the workload itself like, for the pharmacy side especially um, in the value-added services. So mm -hmm. as I think uh, many might know that um, value-added services actually cover in our hospital, we cover mainly, we have uh, three, three or four services, okay? Basically, mm -hmm. uh, we have the Ubat Melalui Post, UMP, where we uh, parcel the medication to the patients, but of course we can't send, um, you know, temperature sensitive drugs like mm -hmm. insulin and uh, like Zalatan eye drops um, and of, of course, uh, dangerous drugs as well. 
can't send them over. But other, otherwise, you know, those uh, those other medications we can send them over uh, through the courier post laju. And then we have the medibox where they don't actually have to enter the um, hospital per se. They can just um, collect it from the uh, cabinet that we have already prepared for them. And then we have two drive-throughs in Putrajaya, one in the hospital itself and the other in the Institute Institute Cancer Negara, IKN, which is just next door to us. So um, what we what what came about COVID-19 is uh, increased by threefold in our uh, Ubat Melalui post. Now, I think many patients were not aware of this before before COVID-19, but thanks to COVID-19, from about 200 patients a week, we went up to 600 patients a week taking medications from um, what do you call that, Ubat Melalui post. And over a month, that's 2,400 patients. That's quite a lot of uh, number of parcels, you know, you have to prepare and send it over. And uh, we have also been actively advocating people to take medications through drive through service. And um, I think we would have seen about a double increase, about 200 patients a week at least in um, our drive through services. So yeah, that, that is the, that, 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 that are the few challenges and measures that we have taken uh, so far to uh, curb COVID-19 and at the same time, you know, help patients get what they need. Morgan, I have a question to you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I just been curious because uh, yeah. last time I was in a hospital practice and we, we do have services like MTech that we, we do have regular patients come yes. back to 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 yeah. refill their warfarin or to see their data, you know, mm -hmm. or those uh, RVD patients that they need uh, continuous uh, monitoring on their uh, white blood cell. How is those um, um, services actually uh, now? Is it still continue or is there are some changes there uh, there have been some changes um, first thing first i think uh, doctors are not starting patients on something uh, what's that very new to them so that we don't have to be doing this counseling that's one and on the pharmacy side itself initially we were doing uh, we were still going full on on our mtech services we didn't stop it but once the cases started increasing and uh, um, i think one of our pharmacies even came in contact with the pui and then we realized that you know we have to slow it down uh, and only in critical cases then i mean like the patient is really new to warfarin and the patient starts on warfarin we have no choice so we still counsel them but um, of course we keep our space distancing uh, almost i mean uh, they wear uh, protective equipments like you know uh, sufficient mm -hmm. to keep themselves away but at the same time give uh, the counseling that is needed so yeah some uh, mtex uh, are still on but on a very selective basis and if if truly necessary only that, that is that methadone clinic is it still ongoing uh methadone clinic okay i'm not very sure because i don't have a methadone clinic in uh so, but I'm, I'm i think in a kk setting it should be going on campaign because right. i think it's a i mean it's a it's a chronic case you know i think patients still need their methadone and whatnot it's just that they would have taken up uh, what is said extra measures to protect the safety of the uh, pharmacists who are dispensing. Mm. See, so in terms of public, when they came to your pharmacy, uh, do you find any issue to keep them like social distancing? The clock management wise, is it controllable during that time or how? Uh, from from the private setting uh -huh. wise. Uh, I, I would say Malaysian are, uh, as general, in general, they actually quite obey with the instruction that being given to them. So we, we do not set these rules and regulations to make them feel difficult or, or feel bad. We actually set these rules actually to protect them and protect mm -hmm. us as well. So I, I would say there are some isolated cases that a patient, a difficult customer that uh, give us a lot of, of problems and um, uh, do not agree to, to comply with the rules and regulation and they threaten us to, to they will complain to the, the authority but i believe as long as we are doing the right thing you know as a big group as a uh, majority of the society is doing the uh, right thing we can actually influence the others from uh, that that do not think this is necessary uh, by doing the right thing so uh, we, I, I would say we face a very minimum uh, resistance from the public. 
So, uh, yeah. Burger, uh, do you find more default patient during the time or they are actually more health conscious wanted to get their medicine as soon as possible? <laughs> actually, I, think, uh, I yeah. think surprisingly, uh, you're right about this, Lingui. Uh, they actually became more health conscious. Uh, okay. They have been, uh, I think the defaulters started taking medicine suddenly. You know, <laughs> I think because um, initially, you know, there were, there were rumors that, uh, I'm not sure, I, I mean, uh, it, it is a partially factual where um patients who are not well already they are more um, at a high risk you know of uh, contracting covid as well so yeah i think um, patient wise they became more aware of their health and um and now we know with the ease of getting the medication as i said you know uh, back in the back before uh, covid patients have to come queue up take their medications wait you know the entire process from seeing the doctor to taking the medicine could take for them one hour to two hours perhaps but uh, mm -hmm. i have to say only half an hour at pharmacy yeah we are very uh, strict with our kpis and everything but yeah the total pro the total process takes a long time but yeah half an hour at the pharmacy is very good time you know for the amount of crowd that we get um but um with covid they realized that you know taking care of your health became easier we can send the medications by post you know it's as easy as that you just need to be at home be safe when the postman comes, take your parcel and that's about it. You know, you are good to go for another two months. So, yeah, nice. the patient, um, I think uh, patient compliance have actually improved um, during this COVID period. Okay, good to hear that. Since uh, Morgan mentioned about like the alternatives, for example, the post medication or the Medibox, uh, can be for your side, uh, is there any alternative besides from physical visit to the pharmacy? Oh, of course. Uh, uh, I, I do see one of comment is my good friend Raymond. Uh, uh, he is the founder and also the CEO of uh, Talk to Us. Uh, one, of, one of the alternative that people is looking at is always e-consultation. And after they consult, uh, uh, there's a prescription generated from the prescription, uh, the, the app to our pharmacy, and then we review the medication and send to the patient. That's one of the alternative. The other the alternative is they actually can contact us directly using our uh, social media platform or our website. So we, we actually have a, a e-store that they, we, have, we can interact with the customer and patient where they can ask us questions and if there is a uh, need to review their medication, then we can refer them to uh, talk to us or to the apps. Or if there is not a prescription item, then we can actually send the medication to them. But in my opinion, my personal opinion, Dispensing itself is not just um, sending the medication to uh, the customer or the patient. It is actually a process. It's the connection between a, a dispenser, the pharmacist, and the patient. For example, I, I can actually um, uh, tell a patient that metformin is good for a diabetic. I mean, everyone knows that metformin is good for a diabetic. But a lot of patients actually do not take metformin or they default their medication because of a lot of reasons. And during dispensing is a time that uh, connect the pharmacist and the patient and find out why, right? We can send the medication. We see a lot of cases that patients uh, return tons of medication back to the pharmacy um, after you know, a year or two or after expired. They do not take the medication. Even they have the medication or even they go and get the medication from the pharmacy. So dispensing is more than just that. That is something that uh, technology that have to be us, um, look into it. Well, how can we be more individualized in terms of dispensing? Uh, it, it can't, looking at this way, I personally feel uh, it is not very individualized. It is um, uh, a, a way that we, we have to use it during this period. And I, I myself encourage actually physical dispensing or on, um, as long as there is a change of doses, there's a new medication being initiated, or there are patients that on medication that and their condition is not controlled. So we want to find out why, right? The patient medi uh, is not taking the medication, or if they take the medication and it's not controlled, or are they experiencing any side effect from it? We have seen a lot of patients taking a lot of uh, medication and they are experiencing side effect, and they didn't know that as long as they stop certain medication and there is a better alternative. They can take, they, they won't experience a side effect. Or there are patients that actually, um, uh, for example, I see a lot of patients that on statin from government hospital.
But when they come to community pharmacy, you ask them, are you taking this medication? No lah. No. <laughs> taking. Oh, uh, my cholesterol level is, uh, is good according to the doctor. And and we they didn't know that the statin actually prescribed that as a secondary prevention for their IAD, for their stroke. Uh, all these things we can only detect when patients come and review and we interview them. So it is actually a process that uh, we shouldn't lose it, uh, in my opinion. And uh, and that is actually another challenges that we face at the moment. When we, we're talking about uh, Ubat Malalu Ipos, uh, or we put it at, at a certain place for a customer to patient to collect it, there is a loss of touch, human touch, in terms of uh, such services. But of course, the convenient factor is a plus point. So I always think that we have to balance between these two points, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it's I, very important that uh, besides make sure the medication reach our patient and customers safely, we also need to ensure that all the information had like reach them and then they can take the supplement or medication in the correct way so that the public awareness is a very important factor that we still need to be ensured during this period despite ensuring their stock supply. Mm -hmm. And Morgan, uh, anything you want to add on just now? Yeah, actually, yeah. Uh, what's it? Uh, going to what Camping was actually saying, um, Ubat Melalui Post actually is not an option for patients who are, um, what is that, uh, just came to see a doctor. Because uh, we usually, uh, those patients who come to see doctor first, uh, we will uh, dispense the medications personally to them. So that, like what Camping said, you know, there is some interaction. There can be change of dose. There can be, you know, improvement on their side or, you know, worsening on their side. So, you know, increase of dose. So uh, we... We always, the first supply is always uh, supply in the hospital so that we can actually counsel the patients during the supply itself. And only subsequent supplies, once you already have the information and you're going to come back in the next six months. So the following subsequent two supplies is the one that we will, uh, what is that, uh, post it to them. So the initial supply is always there where we counsel them at first. But um, of course, you know, with COVID-19, with patients, uh, with, you know, trying to reduce patients' Uh, presence in the hospital itself because um, Putrajaya Hospital is not a hospital for COVID but we still have uh, those Sari patients, the severe acute respiratory illness. So um, there are always chances that you know things can go uh, south from them. So that's a, because of that uh, we try our best to avoid patients coming and that's why you know now we are doing the Ubat Malawi post like very actively. Otherwise as I said First supply, always at the pharmacy first, only after counselling, after like a proper um, what is that process with us, only then can we supply the medications by post subsequently. Lah. So yeah, that's about it. Yeah, I wonder, is there any uh, stock issue for the drugs or medicine during this period that you encounter? And... <laughs> I will allow to comment on this. <laughs> you asking me? Eh? <laughs> no, guys, uh, no. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, uh, we're having a there's a chit chat here, right? So, um, I guess we do have uh, problems for some medications. Not all medications, but just uh, some medications. Um, even companies are finding it hard to source them and everything. So, uh, we are always dependent on the companies to source them first before we take it from them. So. Yeah, but I have to say it's just a very uh, few selected drugs, you know, not everything. So generally, we are doing fine. Um, as I said, um, we are still supplying our patients two months worth of medication uh, most of the time. So, and I think in a, um, our outpatient setting, we only have 15 to 20 drugs that we are a bit short of supply. So 15 out of 20 out of 1,000, I think it's fine, you know, doing quite fine. I even, like, even, even like sanitizer, all these things, when they are all out of stock, uh, pharmacists is actually involved in the active role to find the alternatives. I think, Camping, maybe you can share with us your experience in finding the... Okay, uh, I think, uh, if you look at uh, um, hand sanitizer, I, I would say uh, if we are looking for hospital use, then we are focusing more on the alcohol-based, uh, at least uh, 60% and above. So uh, the general one that you find in Malaysia is 75% uh, or 70% alcohol. 
So again, Malaysia depends on alcohol raw material importation. So um, during last two months, we, we actually faced an uh, alcohol shortage and the alcohol price actually shoot up very high uh, per drum that they import from uh, mainly China. So I think in, in March that time, the importation of uh, alcohol actually getting much better compared to even like during the February time. So um, at that time, yes, it's difficult to find uh, alcohol hand sanitizer. So it is actually one of the hottest items in, in uh, pharmacy market. Or in, in fact, uh, I deal with government supply, some of the government supply. They are actually looking for certain formulation, registered formulation from us to supply the government hospital setting. So yes, at initial, initially it's difficult and to uh, not actually, uh, not every factory in uh, chemical factory is allowed to produce and sell hand sanitizer. Now, of course, in the market, you, you can see all sort of brand at the moment. Uh, certain com uh, company that or manufacturer, they are, uh, initially they are they do not actually deal with hand sanitizer manufacturing or production. They come to the pictures when uh, during the COVID nineteen pandemic. I know. Uh, they want to help. It is a business opportunity. But in terms of healthcare professional, we, we should just stick with those uh, registered and those uh, quality assured products. So, I myself, we actually deal with uh, importation from uh, China, a uh, raw material. So when we import in, we have to get all the documents ready and to register it. And th these are, you know, bricks and butter for a uh, a community pharmacist that deal with importation. And uh, a lot of people say, hey, how, how to do it? And, and that is actually our profession that we are able to, to do it in a short period of time and to ensure that we can deliver uh, uh, this medical supply to the frontliner and also to the public. That is actually one of the very important roles that we are playing. So add on to camping, yeah? uh, mm -hmm. what is that? Um, this is uh, based on my enforcement experience. Like, yeah? Hand sanitizers actually come into the category of cosmetics. So it has to be uh, notified um, in order for it to be, uh, what is that, a product to be um, sold in the market. So like what Camping said, there are many uh, products that were, you know, uh, done haphazardly, you know, just for the sake of monetizing during the COVID period, which mm -hmm. uh, are definitely not approved by the Ministry of Health. But yeah, I mean, um, I think the enforcement side um they would have faced a big challenge you know because we can't conduct our rates the way we used to do it um due to the COVID, and that means that we are going to have more unscrupulous uh, business minded people um taking an opportunity during this period to sell you know unapproved uh, hand sanitizers i mean what's the point if you buy something and it doesn't actually do what it's intended to do so i guess that is a uh, one challenge that uh, enforcement side would have faced uh, and like camping said if they were all good uh, business people like camping, then would have gotten all the right uh, alcohol, hand sanitizers in the market. Sadly, you know, that's not always the case. Yeah, I believe that the quality assurance is still very important during this moment. And besides the PPE and the like, sanitizer shortage, we also heard some issue like um, some healthcare professional, they are actually complain of not getting like, uh, extra allowance inside the workload increase or leave being frozen or even job discrimination for example when they go back to neighborhood they get discriminated by the neighborhood so uh, i wonder if you do encounter this kind of situation or how do you see this issue when you heard of this kind of situation okay um to be honest um, it is quite sad you know that um Okay, it's a personal view again. Uh, so uh, it's quite sad that you know pharmacies always looked at the uh, at. I'm not sure. You know, sometimes we are not even looked at, uh, but most of the time we are looked behind doctors, nurses, and uh, most other healthcare professionals. Um, yeah, allowances has always been an issue for us. Uh, we don't get allowances, and we get time off. But you know, we leave being frozen and everything. It is not as conducive as well. Workload has increased. Even if you want to take time off, you're thinking about your your colleagues behind, you know, like now if I take time off and another person takes time off, can they actually run the pharmacy? So, you know, it is uh, trouble, uh, troubling times for us. 
but uh, we march on and again you know as i said value added services uh, putrajaya um, three times increase was uh, i think unexpected of and mm. um, i've been there for one month plus now and almost on daily basis i'm coming back um, af- after seven you know my working hours is eight to five and i'm not talking about myself i'm talking about my colleagues as well you know who are involved in the value added services we really um i would say we take the ex- we go the extra mile to make sure the patients get their medications so our work finishes around 7 8 every day for the past um three months or so since covid started and it has been challenging because i i have always expected for higher management to come in and really like you know say that you know what you can keep uh, you said um, you can get time off or something like that but as of now nothing none of that is happening so this is what we call uh, really berbakti kepada rakyat lah you know we hmm. do as much as we can for the people jumping how about you oh regarding the the incentive can <laughs> 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 we give bonus or camping i will do uh, um, the the incentive is uh, towards those that have uh, direct uh, contact to the uh, front line covid I, i think is the red zone that we are talking about if the pharmacist or any profession that actually work in that zone they are entitled for uh, the incentive am i right the allowance am i right so it it, it does not actually uh, focusing on who sh- uh, doctors should get and then pharmacists should not get i, I don't think is that issue but um having to say in in a uh, healthcare system uh as a layman everyone that go to a uh, hospital when they, they see you are wearing a white coat they uh, address anyone that wearing a white coat uh, yeah as long as you are female they will call you missy or nurses so in yeah. in a impression um that is the case so when when people thank doctor or nurses in the healthcare system it, it doesn't mean that they give, they uh, discounted the effort of other healthcare professionals as well um of course recognition you know um and reward is actually important uh, and not everyone want a pat on at, at their back for this but that is that shouldn't be the only reason that we look for and and we want to contribute to the healthcare system everyone um, in the healthcare system is important imagine uh, medication supply and a safety of medication without that pillar how how will be the how will be our healthcare system be so that is actually something that i would like to share you uh we sometimes we have to accept that we are not under the spotlight huh, in on the stage but we actually play a very 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 important role to make the whole healthcare system complete right imagine when a government is advocating public prevention and no pharmacy is open community pharmacy is open right that that will actually cause a huge problem to the healthcare system itself so uh, um, being significant and being recognized is equally equal is equally important but sometimes we we just have to accept that you know the public do not have the same perception but we know from ourselves that our role uh, our service are important okay good so uh actually i think this is the last topic that we are going to discuss and i would like to see if there's any comment from the live comment that is i i think i saw one uh, from neri mm-hmm. sling about drive through you know so uh, just like to um, just mention a few things about drive through <laughs> um i think drive through pharmacy is a very good initiative by a lot of uh, what do you call that a lot of uh, hospitals or clinics or so you know but it is um, it, you need to have a conducive uh, place and um, sufficient space to do this So I think uh, Ministry of Health can look into this, you know, because uh, with the COVID nineteen, uh, with the COVID nineteen, there has been a huge exposure to all these services. So I think the uh, moving forward from this, you know, pharmacy will be more actively opening up their services everywhere for drive through and everything, like you know, to for two things. One is for convenience, 
and one is to prevent i mean if such a incident ever happens again such pandemic you know never heard of but if it happens again we are ready to cater for all our patients um whole malaysia right see uh next one oh i saw one from raymond uh, he's asking, answered that yourself. <laughs> how does today's and tomorrow's pharmacy stay relevant to current market needs serving the real pain points of the community by leveraging on technologies um okay if you say the current market needs uh i you know in, in this topic i refer to the covid 19 pandemic so as I mentioned just now, technology uh, at e consultation is one of the way that we actually can address the emergency need at the moment. So now, uh, I actually during normal time we see patient fall sick and go and PGP right at the, at the normal uh, without pandemic before the pandemic. And during this pandemic, surprisingly, all the GPs are um, uh, expressing that uh, they are more than 70 to 80 percent drop in terms of their patient load so it doesn't mean that patients do not uh, fall sick all right i think for a few reasons one is they do not dare to come out second is they get uh two months mc by government so they actually do not need to actually go to a doctor to get mc but for certain conditions that they actually need uh, uh consultation they actually can use technology there are a few uh, apps at, uh, available at the moment and certain doctors even do a live to answer question FOC, you know. So these are uh, uh, technology that they can use to solve the problem. But having to say tomorrow, what, what in the future, I think not only community pharmacy uh, is looking towards it, I think the lead GP is looking towards it, uh, government settings to looking towards it, uh, universal uh, health information uh, uh, system. So everyone should store their uh, system uh, information in the same uh, universal uh, system that where we can access, you know. If you go and see a doctor at one place, you see, uh, then you get a prescription. When you go to see another doctor, you can actually assess the previous um, visit. So that is actually something important and we should actually uh, work towards. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think the yeah. question also what is the, our view on <laughs> e prescription? Yeah. Uh, when we say e prescription, uh, the definition is it has to be a valid prescription. I think not many platforms able to provide that. Uh, one of the platforms that able to provide it is his own platform. That <laughs> 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 when we talk about e prescription, it's not. The uh, signature that we put, you know, we copy and paste, and then uh, just ask the doctor to, to tell you what to take, and then you print it up just like that. Uh, it, it, has, it has to be an encrypted form and uh, registered with certain authority um, with the signature. And when you sign it, it's actually a blockchain te uh, technology. No one can actually change it in between. So when patients get a the position, they, ca they can't alter it. That is actually we call it a valid e prescription and safe prescription. Of course, we welcome e prescription into the picture. If we are looking for technology to come into our healthcare system, then e prescription is one of the important role in, in terms of that. So, and you also save our pharmacists, you know, effort to actually recognize the word uh, of uh, the um, doctor's handwriting. So that that that. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, from an enforcement uh, point of view, I think um, this is something that uh, we should have looked a uh, long time ago, you know. Um, E-prescription should be the way forward for everyone. Um, it shouldn't be something that, you know, we, we can't go back to saying that, you know, uh, what is said, we only can handle manual prescriptions and whatnot. That's a 1952 law, you know. We have to move forward with uh, the current time and everything with a proper system like what camping suggested you know with uh, relevant authorities uh, being involved i think e-prescription should be the way to go and i hope that you know pharmaceutical services division will uh, proactively look into this and i think um, this covid 19 might bring some uh, call that uh, initiatives up front you know to the government and everything and how to improve and 
yeah, um, e-prescription is definitely one way of it. Uh. Yeah, I think even like e-prescription or live streaming, counseling, everything has been start to be more and more proactive during this period. And uh, it's, it's a good way for us to increase public awareness of these uh, services as well. So uh, since time is almost out, so I would like to ask for the one last thing from your both is that, uh, is there anything that you want to tell or share with your fellow juniors um, especially, like I say, some of them might feel a bit discouraged or disheartening when they feel ready being acknowledged during this pandemic period. Mm, okay. Uh, if you, my, my, my opinion is if you depend solely on external, solely external recognition to make you know that what is your role, then you don't, then you, you should, should not even in the first place join the healthcare professional. <laughs> Even even as a doctor or as a nurse, you don't always get recognition. You know, uh, people always talk about the uh, uh, okay, the surgeon is very good, the specialist cardiologist is being good, very good. But how about the doctor that actually work in a hematology unit? How about the doctor that work in a radiology unit? They are equivalent in, in they are a very important role as well. They play a very important role as well. They are doctors that are working in the technology platform like Raymond they are equally important as well. So if it depends on solely on recognition from the people or, or other people on uh, the works that we do, then it's difficult. You, you are keep changing the, the desire of being recognized by the public that, oh, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Then it, it, it is actually um, uh, a wrong choice for you to join healthcare professional in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I, I do agree with campaign, you know, for most of it. Uh, I think um, recognition comes with awareness, you know, uh, many people are not aware of our job. So I think it is up to people like Kemping, myself, you, all of us, you know, to educate the people around us about the importance of uh, pharmacies and whatnot. Um, we we get rec we'll be recognized when there's awareness. And uh, but for our juniors, uh, you have to understand that coming into the pharmacy world, um, let it be the private sector or the government sector. It's not going to be an easy, uh, easy work. You know, it's always going to be, there's there are always going to be challenges, and you have to be up for it. You know, um, in the government side, you know the pay is also so so and everything. You know, but at the end of the day, if you like your job, that is where the reward is. So um, don't come with a lot of uh, hopes, and you know, don't build don't build bridges, like, You know, just be humble come in do the job enjoy what you're doing and slowly or surely you'll you know get what you deserve yeah that's yes, about it I, yeah. thank you morgan i do agree not everything we do you know must be under spotlight and you know as for us a hero is any person that who are really intend to make this society a better place for anyone and of course a uh, healthcare system is a is a cycle is a chain i would say uh we, we cannot survive without each another. So uh, okay. today, of course, I'm very glad to have both of you here to uh, have such a fruitful discussion and sharing, knowing how we actually work together to ensure the whole healthcare chain is still running for all well-beings, despite focusing on just the COVID-19. Okay, so um, again, uh, on behalf of uh, our new Alumni Association and also our new School of Pharmacy, I really, really want to say a very big thank you to both of you, willing to spare your weekend time with us. And also, of course, I would like to thank all the audience for joining us today's session. And if you have any topic of interest that you wish us to organize for a live session with you, please do feel free to drop us a message. Let us know what is your topic of interest. And last but not least, I think, uh, yeah, there's a last comment from Raymond. Thank you for the session. Yeah, very insightful and keep believing and keep innovating. So all the fellow colleagues and Amir alumni, well, what you need to do is, I think, is just keep doing the right thing that you should do. And then public will slowly start to recognize. And then if public is still not recognized, Please just stand out to let them know what are you doing nowadays, like Camping and Morgan. <laughs> All right. So uh, thank you, Camping. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you, everyone. You're welcome. Thank Please you. take care and see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.